Welcome to the Ranchonomics Podcast, where we empower you to build a better ranch and transform your operations into a thriving business. I'm your host, John Haskell. Let's get started. All right, good. Good morning. Welcome to the Ranchonomics Podcast. Wally, glad to have you back with us today. We have a few topics that we need to cover after the first few episodes we did together. And one of them I want to visit about that you and I have talked about multiple times over the years is the difference between owners and managers. And uh, you and I have had the good fortune to find ourselves in both of those roles. And I would like you to break down for me a little bit how you think there, how the owners might think versus managers and a few other things. We'll kind of go on from there. So good morning. Glad to have you. I'm thrilled to be here, as usual. You know, one of the biggest humbling thing about doing these podcasts is realize is that they will never go away. <laughs> so be careful what you say, right? Be careful what you say. And of course, we talked about a few weeks ago, I was on another podcast here. You know, it, the answer is always some version of it depends, but we're going to we're going to commit to something a little bit here. So that makes for a very unsatisfying podcast. So. Let's start a little bit with the, the, the difference between owners and managers and, and sort of how they think. And I'd like to dive in a little when you were the manager of the Kelly Ranch, maybe describe your role a little bit there first, and then we can kind of move on as things have changed. Well, the, the main thing, you know, me as a manager that I always felt that I needed to manage the resources of the Kelly Ranch for the benefit of everyone involved with the ranch. And that includes, you know, the owners of the ranch, the people that, you know, myself and my family and my neighbors, and also the people that worked for me on the ranch. And, you know, you just need to be taking that into account. You know, one of the the biggest things that on management of the Kelly Ranch was making sure that all the 11 stools on the ranch flushed. I mean, because you've got to take care of the people and stuff. And then as far as people, you know, I, I had an old mentor by the name of Orville Burtis Sr. that ranched. And, and he told me that when you're dealing with, with ranch hands, the most important thing you can do is you make sure that the wife is dry and warm and stool flushes. And if she is happy, you can just treat that hand like crap. And as long as he goes home to a happy wife, he's fine with it. He goes home to an unhappy wife and it just doesn't work out. Doesn't matter how happy he is at that point. That's correct. One of the things that when we had more people, right? So if we are, for example, managing a place for someone else, then what that means is, you know, you're managing the resource for the benefit of all those involved just means there are more people involved, right? That's correct. And generally that means more people generally means that they have, you know, an objective or purpose for their involvement. And we've got to make sure that we're tied into that, understand what it is and and how to include that in our daily activities, right? Correct. To me, the biggest thing to be, you know, a good manager is to address the needs of the people that are involved. Yeah. And the other one that comes up frequently is that when we work for someone else, it's often a family corporation or a, or a family itself or a corporation, but we are, we are a public face of that company or family. And so we represent not just ourselves, but also them when we're doing things in the community or doing deals. You know, with, whether it's with livestock or grass or at the 4-H sale or any of those things, right? Yeah, you are, in theory, the face of the, of the ranch out there in public. And with being the manager and the owner, what you need to do is protect your good name, the good name of the ranch or the, your good name in the business, because most of the business of ranching is on your word. You know, and, and a handshake, but also I'm an f- absolute believer in written contracts so that when the man that shook your hand in the round, you can come up with what you guys agreed to and the other parties can address what we've agreed to. You know, I'm a big believer in your word and handshake, but also write it down. Yeah. When you are looking for a management job, and I know you've done this a few times in your life, what are you looking for? What kind of opportunity do you want? 
What, what you, and I, here we go back. I'm going to tell another story. So here we go. When I was going down to interview for the Kelly Ranch job, this Mr. Burtis that I spoke about before, and he told me, he said, he said, now, Wally, he said, if you go down there and, you know, it's a well-managed ranch and stuff, he said, you want to just get the hell away from it because if you get the job, you'll be compared to the old manager and, and the family, you know, just, I won't like you. I mean, it'd just be tougher. He said, what you want to do is go find the most screwed up ranch you can find. And that's where you want to go because there's nothing you can do wrong and everybody will appreciate it. And so when I was down interviewing for the Kelly Ranch job, I soon discovered visiting with the family that there was some problems there and some really big problems. And I decided that, boy, I would really like to get the Kelly Ranch job. I mean, it had everything that I ever wanted. You know, it was all contiguous. It was further south where you didn't have to hay all summer and feed it all winter. I mean, it was just what I wanted. And so when you really find something you really want, boy, you might as well just shoot for the moon. And so I told Mr. Flint this story that Mr. Burtis told me. And about, well, you want to go to work on a really screwed up ranch, and sir, yours is pretty screwed up. And he informed me, well, that was why I was there. And so we go on down the road, I get the job, and he informed me they interviewed two other people, and he said, he said, I had a tie on when I interviewed those other guys, and he said, smoke was just coming out of my neck, even with my tie on, because they were blowing that much up my butt about how well managed the Kelly Ranch was, when obviously it wasn't. And needless to say, we were, I was there for, I don't know, 25 years, had a great time. It all worked out. To me, it was as fulfilling to manage the Kelly Ranch as owning a ranch. I mean, it's just your mindset of it's great to own a wonderful ranch and I've missed some great opportunities. To me, there's operations and real estate business. When you own a ranch, you're just in real estate business. When you operate the ranch, you know, you're in operations and I've missed some great opportunities in real estate. Yeah. So let's touch base on on something here and expand a little. So if you are the owner of the ranch versus the manager of the ranch, there are some differences in how you how you sort of approach the business of the ranch. And one thing that I always like to make clear to people is if you are not the owner, while we always want to, you know, sort of have a stewardship mentality and that sort of thing, what what in your mind do you do you do differently when you're not the owner? So one thing for example that comes to mind for me is if I don't own the ranch, there maybe are a little more limits of of where I'm willing to go as an employee. And I don't want to sound like I have a bad attitude here, but this is not a multi-generational investment that I'm making on behalf of my family. Whereas when I am the owner, that may be a little bit different. And I think this is an important concept for owners to hear also. We sometimes expect our employees to act just the same way we do as owners. And of course, really they shouldn't. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, to me, when you are a manager of a ranch, you've got to understand, like when I drove down the driveway the first day at the Kelly Ranch, I knew there was going to be a day when I was going to drive back down that driveway. You're going to drive back out, yeah. Drive back out, and it was just, it was, the, the Kelly Ranch was behind me, you know. And I would highly recommend for people that are managers that it, when you do that, don't ever go back because it changes and stuff. So, you know, and I shouldn't say that never go back. I mean, I love that ranch and I still go back and stuff. But but you go back in a different capacity now. I go back in a different capacity. And now I go back. I, I go back as a hypocrite and say, well, that guy, he, boy, he sure did some stupid stuff there. He didn't need to do that. You know? and we can be our own worst critic, can't we? Yes, we can be our own worst critic. And one thing, one thing being a manager you know, you've got to be careful. I worked for a gentleman and all he had done his whole life is manage ranches and he'd manage some big ones and good ones. And he just drilled into you that by golly he said, you've got to understand that you've got to be careful. So when you turn 65, that all you have left is a pickup car, a house full of furniture 
and and used the furniture and a couple of horses. He said, if, and you can live very well during your life, but you've got to be cautious about that. So, yeah, so there may be a day when you retire or get hurt or need to leave that job when now you need to find a place to go with all that stuff, right? Yep. And, and also, I hate to tell you, but a retirement on two or three horses, an old war out trailer and, and a house full of used furniture. It ain't going to be a very good life, I mean. Not exactly glamorous living, huh? And that's a very important thing. Again, as an owner, you can be investing in the livestock. You can be investing in the land. You know, you are building equity in the operation itself, which then later on you can take out. And as an employee, you are not doing that. And again, I'm a strong advocate for, you know, a really strong stewardship mentality, even for employees, but we have to recognize the reality that one of us is gaining equity and, and one of us is taking cash out of the business, right? That's correct. And and also, though, you can have, you know, incentive programs set up. Oh, absolutely. Where, you know, if you increase the value of the ranch, if you increase the carrying capacity of the ranch, you get a share of that somehow. And this is another thing. To th so now we've switched perspectives a little bit and think of it as the owner, right? What can we do with our employees as owners to help them so that, again, they're not building equity, but, but we want to get everybody's vision and goals aligned, right? Let's, let's get everybody on the same page as far as pulling to the same purpose. One thing is my philosophy with employees was to always have them help them succeed in, in what they want. You know, I was adamant about that. One of the philosophy I have, if you work, if you work for the Kelly Ranch for five years, you probably ought to be moving on because you've advanced up to a point where you can move up the, you know, management ladder. Granted, I had some people that, that worked for me for 20 years and stuff, but they, they were happy. You got to understand where people are at. You've, you've also had a number of employees go on to run their own operations, and uh, I can think of two right off the bat, and they have been very successful and done a really nice job, and they've kind of replaced you in the, in the world, right? One of my goals is to create people better than I, which some people could say, well, that wouldn't take much, but you know, my, my deal is, is just help people be better. You know, just go down the road and, and, you know, if you're worried about somebody being better than you, you know, if you don't have the confidence in yourself, you know, I've never competed with anybody else in this world. I've only competed with myself. And one thing that I learned from dealing with Bud Williams is every day you need to be better. And you may move forward a quarter of an inch someday and other days you may leap forward miles, but you just always be better. And developing that culture on your team is really an important piece, right? That's correct. Matter of fact, it eats some people up. You know, there was a, there was a lot of people that worked at Kelly Ranch over my tenure, and I don't know whether I was a bad boss or what, you know, but it just is what it is. Yep. Very good. At Ranch Right LLC, we believe your ranch deserves more than just survival mode. You deserve to thrive. Our experienced accountants and business coaches will help you get control over your financials so you can focus on what you do best, running the ranch. We offer a comprehensive process that includes bookkeeping, consulting, and even training tailored to your needs. Don't let your financials slow you down. Visit RanchRightLLC.com to schedule your free consultation and let Ranch Right take care of the numbers so you can take care of the rest of it. Okay, let's talk a little about, you know, sort of risk tolerance and and uh, maybe even motivation. So to my mind, a lot of owners have, you know, goals for owning the ranch that might keep us from doing things that maybe even maximize profitability. And I think a lot about when we hear, you know, guys like Burke talk, Burke's a wonderful ranch manager who's worked in different parts of the country. But, you know, Burke worked for an organization that had a specific purpose. And I sometimes think about the fact that that organization maybe doesn't allow Burke to pursue some opportunities in marketing, for example, that maybe we would as individual owners. Do you want to talk about that at all? Well, one thing to me, you got to sit down and 
set up, you know, your goals and your, you know, your mission statements and your vision for the ranch. And so, so you're, everybody's on the same page. Fortunately, when I was on the Kelly Ranch, the ownership of that ranch wanted it to be profitable, number one. And we also, you know, the older gentleman that, that owned the ranch was an avid quail hunter, and he wanted to have quail. And so we understood that. So we did things that may benefit the quail almost more than the cattle grazing. So it's, you know, we had balance there. And they let you, you know, you came up with a business plan and a budget for the year, and they, if they approved it, you're on your way. Whereas you get into some management positions, the owners will come up with, they go down to the country club and drink a couple too many scotches and get to visit with their friends and come up with this brilliant idea, you know, that you're going to go into the purebred Hereford business or the purebred beef business, you know. And I see more ranches where they come in and they build huge sale barns, and it just amazes me how a gentleman that make money in one business and how they can just fiddle it away in ranching, I mean, and stuff. And we see that we see that a lot. But again, as the manager, you are there to implement the, you know, visions, dreams, aspirations of the owner, right? That's kind of how that works. And if the owner wants to deploy their capital in a way that might not be what you think is best, that your job is still to go ahead and do that, right? As, as best you can. That's correct. You know, and there's also comes to a point in time when you, you have to say, I cannot morally do that and move on. Yeah, right. And I've found for myself, I've got a strong profit motive. So working with people that don't have a strong profit motive is often not a good fit. Well, one thing, one thing you need to realize is that the ultimate number one goal of all ranches need to be profitable because there is only so long that People with wealth are willing to cough up cash to cover something. And being profitable and achieving all the other goals is really pretty easy if you just put, you know, management to it. That's right. Just like, just like my friend and mentor Walt Davis said, you know, ranching is rainfall, sunshine, and management. And that's all it is. And we would do well to keep it that simple, wouldn't we? That's correct. So there was a period of time on the Kelly Ranch where you were the, you know, just the manager. And then there was a period of time where you were the lessee that operated it. So Olson Ranch LLC and when operating at the Kelly Ranch operated a little differently than Wally Olson managing the Kelly Ranch for the family. Tell me a little about the differences there. The biggest thing on when, when we leased the ranch over when I managed the ranch, my wife and I assumed you know, the risk of ranching or a wonderful paycheck. You understand what I'm saying? I can't remember the, can't remember the date now. It was, I think, you know, one July, I got a really nice paycheck. During August, there was nothing, nothing, no paychecks all the way on, you know, so. My father used to tell me when, oh, be careful when you go to work for somebody else because, man, that paycheck that shows up every two weeks is really addictive. And boy, he was right. <laughs> That'll keep you an employee for longer than you think. Yes. Unless you are looking down the road and preparing to go out. Yep. And, you know, when I managed at Kelly Ranch, we had a lot of stuff in house. We had employees. And understand that when I leased the Kelly Ranch, we only leased half of it, we sold the other half. So it was cut down in size. And, my wife and I, or I was mainly, I was not wanting to manage employees. And when you have employees, you know, there's lots of stuff, you know, you've got to have, you know, you got to pay them. You got all the file, your social security taxes and withholding taxes. And you got to have workman's comp and on and on and on. And so we decided that we were going to outsource certain stuff. One is I I hate driving a truck and hauling cattle. So we outsourced that. We had a, a wonderful neighbor that had a ground load that would haul cattle. So we outsourced it to Des, Des Wooten. And, and since we were in the stalker business, we had a gentleman that he only handled steers, but he was willing to buy heifers for us. He would start them for us. And so 
and he would deliver to us started cattle. So we were we were mainly ranching or grazing. And so, you know, we changed the management of the ranch. Very good. Did you run the same type of cattle? Did you run different types of cattle? Why did you do that? Nope. We pretty well just ran the same, same cattle. Very good. And how did your, personally, how did your sort of equity situation change going from, you know, getting a paycheck and then saving a portion of it, let's say I'm putting it into a 401k or an IRA, how did that change compared to then when you, when you then? One thing, every woman, you need to bear in mind that, you know, timing is critical in ranching. Mm -hmm. And uh, Olson Ranch LLC went out on its own in August of 2008. Mm-hmm. And we, we ran till 2016. Well, there was, there was no better time in the world to be in ranching than those eight years because of what the market did. Up to that point, right? Yeah. And Oh, I, it's going to be, it's going to have to really get better, you know, <laughs> that was a pretty good time. But uh, the thing, the thing was, is with being prepared, you know, back to Bud Williams, we were prepared to handle the market and the good Lord gave us, however you want to look at it, the good, as far as greedy me, you know, the good Lord gave us a drought and terrible drought in Texas where we could buy cows for next to nothing i think that drought wasn't just in texas it was all through the southeast right yes it was it was a big deal let's talk about being prepared for just a minute because we're talking about the drought that was it was around 2010 11 12 right 12 was the year that it wore everybody out and they just and i will tell you personally i used to go down and visit wally on a regular basis and i would drive south and at that point i was Around then, I was living in Nevada, I think, but it could have been Utah or Nebraska also. But but either way, drive down there, and I would drive across miles and miles of drought-stricken country that looked terrible. And man, when I got to your fence, it was like, what in the world happened here? Like, this is a whole different place. There was grass everywhere on on the Kelly Ranch. And it uh, didn't really matter what the weather was. That was in good years or bad. There was always grass on the Kelly Ranch. So maybe tell me a little about that, because that's a preparation thing, I think. Basically, you know, going back to Bud Williams and always have money and grass, you made sure that you had money and grass to be able to take care or be prepared for opportunities. Yeah. And that's the philosophy we operated under and we had we had managed grazing systems and yep so when the price of cattle really dropped you had feed we had feed and in 2012 the price really dropped so you've got a few examples of some of the cows you bought in 2012 what were we paying in 12 for that cow we paid an average of, i think it was 642 dollars for a lot of what we called open wet bag cows. They were young cows that they'd strip the calves off of that were open and they just were thin. They they just weren't much. Yeah. And in our current coal market, I mean, you can't even buy a poorly open cow right now for anywhere near that money. A lot of cows selling at a dollar, dollar thirty five, dollar forty five range and so significantly higher than that. So buy a good a good young cow for six hundred bucks. And then the the run up we saw in the market just a few years later, some of those gals wound up being worth three thousand dollars there within three four years, right? That's correct. Plus, plus giving you a couple calves in the interim. Correct. Yeah. And the thing is, is you, know, you need to be able to do good marketing because you know just six months ago, you could buy cows in a drought area along the Kansas Missouri line for. Twelve hundred to thirteen hundred dollars. Yep, pennies on the dollar kind of thing. Pennies on the dollar, and it was just moments later that you moved them to an area where it rained. And- yeah, and they were worth a lot more. Yes. All right. Well, let's let's wrap up a little with ownership versus management. Is there anything else you want to talk about there? We we got off track here a little bit. Talk about drought and managing grass, but to me, one of the biggest things is is owner and management. Most of the time. 
you should have absolutely the same goals. Yes. The, the, if you own something, you know, you're worried about equity and longer term. If you're the manager, you're, you're, you're concerned about long term, but you're, you're more interested. You know, I mean, your, your time isn't hundreds of years. It's, it's your working life and preparing, you know, for that. But, but like I said, when you go to work for somebody, you have to make the decisions that are based on what is best for the asset that you're managing. Yep. Just like when I was 55 years old, right in there, you could tell things had changed in the family. And I was down for a budget meeting and I realized that we did not need to do a budget for next year. We needed to talk about selling the ranch because an unloved ranch is, is a terrible thing to have around. Yep. Yeah. And that is where the, the opportunity for me to lease the Kelly Ranch came about. But, but also, I did not, you know, I did not know they were going to lease it to me when I said we need to sell this asset. But be, you know, humble and kind and fair and honest in everything you do. And it usually works out for the best. Yeah. Very good. Well, the, I think the biggest thing I think of is the purpose of owning the ranch often adds constraints. And so when, when we deal with an owner, we have to understand what the constraints are. And when I listen to managers who are not owners speak, I try to always be cognizant of the fact that they work for an owner, that owner has constraints. And, and sometimes those constraints are explicit, but sometimes they are not. And we need to be very, very careful of, of how we understand the application of the principles and practices that they use on how they are reflected within the constraints that are posed by ownership and management. That is absolutely correct. I mean, you need to, you know, know and understand yourself and, and understand exactly where you're at. And then, you know, you got to decide whether we can live in these constraints or we can't, and, and you just move on. Very good. Very, very good. All right, Wally, thank you for joining me today. I appreciate you visiting about this. This is a topic that comes up fairly regularly. So appreciate you giving your time. You've got a couple of schools coming up this fall. I would like to have you talk about real quickly. I think your website's Olson Ranch LLC, right? Has them on there. The one coming up the 9th of September is a stalker school with Don Notto and Steve Campbell. I promise you it will be a good time, a great learning experience. And if you aren't happy, I'll give you your money back. Very, very good. What else you got coming in the fall? And then I've got a marketing school coming up, and I can't remember the date right now, but it's like the 19th of November, and then there's one in January. And then Ranching.FYI is going to do a simulation school for the, as the market goes down in Gillette, Wyoming, if it doesn't burn up. In what the twenty second, I think of October. Yep, last week of October there. So check out the FYI website, which is ranching dot FYI, for dates and specs on that. Very good. All right, anything else? Nope, that's that's enough for today. Sounds great. Well, Wally, you have a wonderful day, and we will talk soon. Thank you for tuning into the Ranchnomics podcast. We hope this episode helped you win today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with a friend.